where we are. I should take the background off. Sorry. <laughs> there we are. Hey, believe it or not, we are in the Tocqueville room. I know. I think that is, in and of itself deserves a round of applause. Two years later. <laughs> Um, and such a wonderful way to kind of welcome us back by featuring um, today Diego and his wonderful, wonderful work here. So just to, just to tee us up, Diego, um, maestro, I'm sorry, <laughs> Barbosa Vasquez, obviously a, um, a, a from Colombia originally, but working on not only performance aspects here, doing some really interesting work on opera sustainability through multi-level apprenticeship programs at opera companies. Has a lot of stuff in the works that we can get into, including potentially a summer camp, which is just so exciting. Um, there is another performance as well, if you were enjoying that, that Diego will be um, kindly uh, inviting us to. It sounds like on April 3rd, Diego, yeah. so after spring break. Yeah. Um, so if you enjoyed that, we'll make sure to get the word out and hope you can attend um, that special session as well. But per usual, for the time being, we'll start with uh, Diego's remarks and wonderful presentation. We'll have a discussion to follow, both live in the room here, as well as virtually. So I will yeah, yeah, do my best to moderate both here. So um, thanks again for coming. Thank you, Diego, for giving us the opportunity to feature you and uh, look forward to your, uh, to your presentation. <laughs> First of all, thank you so much all for uh, allowing me to do this work here in the Austrian workshop. Um, well, as you know, my presentation more than paper is Opera Sustainability. And if you uh, wanted to, Diego, just because, yes. can they see you from, I don't know if I don't know if David has the camera automatically tracking. Yeah. Oh, there. Okay. So maybe if you just start talking, it'll track to where you are. So Hello. I'll be quiet. One, two, three. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. I guess it's <laughs> we found a bug in the system. <laughs> <laughs> Is this tracking me? Yeah. There I, it. I will also mess with. I know I can freeze it so that you don't have to worry about it. So maybe while while you're getting started, I'll see if I can if I can help with that. Okay. Okay. And we're, we're going to get this. We're going to get back in business here. Okay. okay. So I froze it on you. Okay. <laughs> so I think if you roughly look at, you know, look at us, the camera's obviously coming from up there. So. Okay. So you're good. If, if that's not too distracting. Yeah. Let's okay. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so Opera Sustainability specific, specifically through multi-level apprenticeship programs. Um. First of all, obviously, thank you so much for the awesome workshop. All the people that has helped me a lot, David, Emily, Skoda, and Jean, Sadan, Michael, a special thank you to Gustavo Torres, my workshop, awesome workshop advisor and mentor. And thank you for the Jacob School of Music people that has helped me a lot. And the, in general, the opera field community that has helped me with the data and so many clues how to address that issue. And also a homage for Alison Studio that was that this week and it's uh, well, very helpful too. Um, some disclaimers. First of all, as you were seeing, I am an opera orchestra and ballet conductor. Therefore, as you will see in the paper, there are going to be things that for me are very natural. Therefore, please let me know if I have to explain a little bit more. Second, obviously, the terminology that I use is going to be more from that. I am trying to incorporate as much as I can the socioeconomic terminology, but I know that you're going to help me a lot, help me a lot with that. Also, uh, there is a pre paper in process, therefore, any ideas, suggestions, highly welcome for that. And what we are going to see today in the presentation is a brief summary because, for the sake of time, therefore, there is more information in the paper or we can discuss after that. Also, for a matter of perspective, this uh, 10 years uh, research that started in uh, 2018 with the Opera Summer Camp that I lead in Los Angeles. Then I did my doctoral dissertation that is focusing on the music, uh, music, artistic, and pedagogic models that was with the Jacob School of Music. This year is focusing on understanding the basics of the field. The next year is going to be uh, create the administrative community and financial models to then move into the Autron Opera Camp Laboratory that we are going to discuss and it's going to be a five years research. Therefore, the first question that in general makes the full opera sustainability uh, research is, is opera dying. Mm -hmm. We have a very alarming 
a study from the National Endowment for the Arts saying that there is very few people assisting to the operas and even in just a little bit, it's reducing a lot. But it's very crazy because we also know that arts create multiple benefits for the community in so many ways. And the opera is the one that has all the arts there. Therefore, it's very, very interesting why this is happening. Therefore, uh, this year we started with three research questions trying to understand that. Uh, however, the amazing part of being here that you made me realize that in order to understand that, we also have to, first of all, understand what is opera from the socioeconomic terms, mm -hmm. also understand the problems, and then how these possible apprenticeships are solving or creating solutions or not. Therefore, in terms of opera, we have some questions to resolve. And the way that we did it is my dissertation already have some information about uh, those kind of things. And also we had to do a financial analysis for other operas to see the relation. First of all, what is opera? Uh, when we talk about opera, many people think about those kind of image, a very huge voice, huge orchestras, huge production, very slow operas, very boring, and very long ones, like four hours and a half. <laughs> Or this is just <laughs> one type of opera, that is Wagner operas. We also have La Viata, kind of operas from Verdi, or we have La Bohème from Puccini. They're totally different things. We have also modern operas, or even we have rock operas. Therefore, at the end, what we know is that opera is just music, sound drama, and a spectacle as a combined type of opera. Mm. More than that is that subgenres, and they are very different, each one from the others, but this is open. The second element is that we have two action arenas, the artistic action arena and the governance, let's say. For the artistic one, we have the creators, the performers, the spectacle creators, and this set of people is gonna be around from 20 to 200, 300, Therefore, in that we also have the need for directors that are gonna organize in many ways this kind of thing. Also, we have the other element of how this is governed because one is artistic, it's just the product itself, but how we prepare for this product. Mm -hmm. And the way that the opera make that is something called the opera company. It's a, the way that they organize. Some are very small and don't have the term opera company, but when you analyze, they are also moving less as an opera company, therefore in general it's an opera company. And in that we have also four elements here. First of all, the heads, the board that is gonna take the full decisions at the end. In order to be a board, you have to put a lot of money, 99% of the cases. That's very important, we are gonna come back to that. And also we have two heads of the company, the CEO or the general manager, administrative side, and the artistic director, the full administrative side, both have the same power or should have the same power. There is also the administrative staff. Obviously, the bigger the company, the more people here, the smaller, the less. We have the artistic staff. It's different from the artistic arena because now we are not talking about the performance. We are talking the ones that prepare the performance. Therefore, we have that. And also, we have the external actors. I don't spend so much time um, explaining every one of here because it took us so much time. For instance, we had created an opera podcast where we were talking about music director and it got us like one hour and a half and we are talking just one perspective and some kind of alterations. Therefore, this is a huge pool of research that we can do with these things because the way the opera works a very polycentric structure or should be a good one in order to get good results. Also, we know uh, we have to talk about business model. We know that the business model is a subsidized model because the tickets only cover 35 to 50% of the full production cost. Therefore, in the United States, we have private support and few government support. In Europe, we have a stronger government support, few private. And in Latin America, we have few government support and even less private support. That also is uh, affecting the budgets 
because in Europe we have around 3 million average. Here in the United States, only 40. We don't have that all Latin America until this moment. Only Metropolitan Opera in the United States has this kind of budget. Therefore, we also know the difference, and obviously, this is going to influence the artistic product that we can create with that. Uh, this is opera. Now, let's see the problems. Well, opera has multiple problems. And obviously, it's going to take us so much time to define all of that. But we tried with the Austrian Worship West trying to see which is the core of the problems. And what we came out is the current business model. Why is problematic? Because in our perspective, it's created a lot of uh, difficulties for long-term development. Why? This is an example of the Metropolitan Opera. And you will see that if you analyze five years period, there is losing money when you compare tickets and other revenues for the opera. However, when you put the uh, a subsidized model, you just see a little bit of, of losing money. That's something we, we can discuss in more detail in the, in the paper. And also we have a very alarming situation because from these five years, the Metropolitan Opera loses 5% of its assets. That's very, very alarming in just five years. Uh, and why? Because the long term, first of all, non continual funds. Mm -hmm. If we analyze the chart on the left, we see the contributions, gifts, all of that. And we will see that is very uh, pricey, <laughs> let's say. Mm -hmm. However, if we analyze the right one, that is just tickets and review, we see that is a more predictable thing. It's decreasing, that is alarming, but at least it's predictable. Uh, that's something I want to confirm with the people that is experts in philanthropy, if we can really try to create a long-term development for that. But from my perspective, it's being very difficult also for the chiefs of donators, donors' behavior. The second thing is the ballot, uh, balanced budget governance, because yes, at the end, because this is so fluctuating at, at the beginning of the year, what you have to do is, where I'm going to cut things to be able to to do my, my season. Therefore, you have less payroll that is going to affect the human resources and therefore it's going to affect the artistic result and it's going to be translated in less tickets, less revenue, less branding, all of that. Mm -hmm. And also a very dangerous thing, the culture of selling assets. The, we have the example of the New York City Opera case when they started to sell in assets in order to balance the budget until a point that they were and they have to put file bankruptcy. And that's something that as you see in the metropolitan case, probably is, is a case. And for some quotes, I can say that is the case. And also that's the more complexity aspect of here is, is creating a symmetrical powerful actors in the boards. Mm -hmm. Because if the boards are the ones that are gonna take the decisions, but they can only enter putting money. And we have cases as a donor saying, I have $10 million, but you have to produce this specific opera with this specific singer, this specific conductor. I don't matter about your long-term development. I don't matter about what you are building your opera company. I just want this thing. And at the same time, you are having 50% of my budget is here. Obviously, it has created a very difficult situation because you are serving just one person. It's broken the polycentric dynamic. And that's where we are because it creates difficulties for both and also difficulties to be uh, current with the current, current cultural changes, the aesthetic cultural changes. And the most important element here, we are seeing that the people is less interested in opera. Therefore, the donors is also that kind of things. And the, the money is shifting from old uh, people to new to younger people and the younger people is not connected with the opera for it also is a very dangerous aspect because we are losing the people that can put us money in order to try to solve that we are working in an hypothesis about the circle of opera we have the money the human resources the opera experience meaning the concert or the program on how the people is connected with the opera and the people. We know that these are governance decisions, who you are going to hire, how much you are going to pay, whatever. 
We also know that there is also a governance decision about which kind of opera experience you are going to do. And we also know that there is a governance a decision also called marketing that is how you are going to broadcast or say that you are doing things for the community but it's just marketing you can marketing whatever you like in the way that you want without changing really the opera experience that's what is here we also know that the human resources influence the opera experience the better the artist the better the opera experience and similarly the other way and we also know that if the opera experiences is well crafted it's going to influence the community in a good way and if not, it's going to influence in a bad way. Mm -hmm. We also know that the more community we have, the more money we are going to have because it's tickets, it's donors, it's a lot of that. But we also know that there is a disconnection here. The community is not influencing the opera experience. If we talk about business, it's like creating a product without looking at the buyer and what the buyer needs. That's a complex thing to do. And because of that, we are trying to define if the opera is an idea in a death spiral, because we know that there is less, less people here. We also know that there is less money here. We also know that many people is shifting from professions because they cannot have money to continue in this path. Therefore, it's also have, affecting that. This is a very dangerous spiral. Therefore, we are trying to see if the opera is in that and will be a message we can talk also about that a little bit. Now we know Paris Opera, now we know the problems, let's see the solutions and how we can see if they work. Returning to that, we started to think, well, which elements we can control? We know that community, creating community just by itself is not possible. You cannot oblige someone to go and see opera. So no opera companies do that approach and it doesn't work. Uh, we, also don't, we also know that we cannot produce money just by whatever, there are some fine, uh, fundraising things that are very connected with the full thing, therefore you cannot create money. However, you have two powerful things in your governance decisions. You can be sure that your governance decisions are good for human resources and are good for opera experiences. And the solutions in that case are the apprenticeship programs and the multi-level programs. What is the apprenticeship programs? It's very simple, you work, for a less payment because you are going to receive training. In terms of the opera, usually it's done for singers where they are training as a soloist while they work as a chorus or as a covers, that is that secondary roles. And uh, there are few examples of other actors, but are just very few. And what that gives you is, first of all, you balance your budget because you have, uh, in the case of Santa Fe Opera, that is the example here, you can pay one fourth or one sixth of what you should pay for a, for a singer. However, the singer is also happy with that because they are receiving very specific training in things that are unique. Therefore, as I said, you don't study opera, you don't you know opera, and the unique way to know how what is opera, you have to do opera. Therefore, that's very useful for them. Also, that helps to put new donors because now you are looking for a scholarship payroll and that opens a huge brand of donors. The human resources, you are training very good your, your human resources in the way you want and also your artistic quality is gonna grow, therefore it's much better for, for the opera company. And also the allows you to create multiple alliances because now you are gonna be a bridge between, let's say, lower levels opera companies or universities and higher opera companies and you create that bridge because you are training people and that creates you so many possibilities for the for your branding and for your business model and for your fundraising all of that uh, which are which is the applicability for these kind of programs in different local arenas to do that obviously we are going to use the AAD framework that is very useful because has things as context uh, in terms of biophysical things. Well, Santa Fe Opera is a desert. Therefore, when you are there and you are an artist, you just can do that because there is no more to do. Therefore, it gives the opportunity to have people working so many hours and without conflicts of other things. Also, it's a very wealthy city full of art lovers, therefore there is a need for those kind of experience there. 
and also in terms of institutional arrangements, while there is not other opera company or people that wants to see opera go there. And finally, it's a very unique you know, agreement that allows the Santa Fe Opera to, let's say, overwork the singer in, in, in a way that in other places is not possible. Because in addition of being the chorus or the covers, they have to also sing here and do that and do that and do that. And that's a very unique thing that they have. Also, their actors, uh, they had a founder, John Crosby, that is very clear, clever people that can balance an orchestra, balance a budget, know how much water do you need in the breaks of the performances. Those kind of minds are very unique. And also, it's very well connected because the, the, the family of him was in Santa Fe for so many years and was wealthy because he has $1 million to create an opera company. That's something important that we have to consider. And also a powerful artistic advisor that was working as an artistic uh, manager from the full international pool. Therefore, he was able to have really good human resources to do that because he had the possibility to create those kind of alliances. Those are very unique. However, it doesn't affect the main goals because also you can balance a budget you can have good human resources not as good as this kind of artistic manager could do but we can do it and also it allies uh, a lot of multiple alliances again not as good as this uh, artistic manager did but it's, you can do it the other element uh, that we want to discuss the multi-level apprenticeship programs. Uh, this is the um, that I lead in Los Angeles. The multi-level is a proposal where communities, students, and professionals can produce and perform opera all together. Produce and perform. Not only just people seeing the opera and the professionals doing it, no, as a, as a common thing. And what this create us is educational business model. Again, we don't have so much payroll. Instead, we have people paying and we have availability for other donors. And also, and that is the most crucial thing here, the community involvement. Because when you are crafting this kind of experience for the community, you also have to consider them. And that is creating a good thing for the problem that we had before. They were not really in, into the opera experience. We know now our solutions, therefore our conclusions. First of all, the multi-level apprenticeship programs are a good institutional development. Our they are only usually focusing singers or very few actors. We have to and have the opportunity to expand for so much, many actors. We also know that the community is not present in the decision making arenas in the opera. However, the multi-level experience can solve it. And we also know in the paper, you will read that with more uh, specificities, but we have so many process, problems accessing valuable data. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we need better data for sure, because so many analyses are, let's say, in a 60% because we don't know the full pick, and that's problematic. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what next? And what is the next step? Well, the proposal is try to create the Austrian Opera Camp Laboratory. The laboratory is going to be a full year academic year running, where with an interdisciplinary working group uh, from different schools as, a, as a, in IU and the opera field, we are trying to create, first of all, an opera trust hub in order to get access to this kind of data, to intercorrelate uh, this kind of data with the music, artistic, and pedagogic, pedagogic models of my dissertation that is already written and proves that the apprenticeship programs in multi-level is possible from this perspective. And also to, with the practicality of the opera field, apply our Bloomington School Governance theories, trying to re, re, re heal or reconstruct the polycentric governance that is necessary in opera. Uh, and that is gonna be done with the creation of the administrative business and community models in order to create the camp that is a two weeks experience in May 13, 2023, or a camp for multi-level apprenticeships for all actors, not only singers, for all actors. And proof 
in a way of proving if this is working or not, because this is the idea with the full camp laboratory. It's a circular cycle when we work in the academic year to, from the theory, understand what is possible, look at what we can create, develop the governance models, and try to prove in the camp if it's working or not. We have now more data because of the camp, and that is going to give us for the next year the possibility to reevaluate these governance models and with the circular cycle be sure that at the end of the this five-year period and probably longer, we are going to understand the opera sustainability clues with this proposal. That's the presentation. Again, it's a paper in process, therefore any kind of ideas, suggestions, uh, bibliography, very important too. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Diego. Fantastic. Here, I'm gonna enable the camera tracking again, so maybe we can have that zoom around. We'll see how that you guys, you guys zooming in, let us know how this is working, okay? Lovely. So, uh, so well done. And then, like we said in the chat there, you know, per usual, we'll just kind of go down, uh, go down the list here. Um, uh, Mike, I think I see your hands, uh, hand go up first. So we'll turn to you if that's okay. And I have one or two as well. We'll take it from there. Okay, thanks, um, uh, Scott and, and Diego for this, this um, quick uh, and uh, kind of head spinning overview of, of what was a very long paper. Uh, and um, I think you did a really good job of laying out the, uh, the general sort of picture. Uh, I do have one um, uh, complaint though, is that at the very beginning you were showing this video of yourself conducting this performance in, um, uh, in Bloomington. And you know, if the camera had been directed just one more row higher, my wife Sheila and I would have been on camera uh, in, in the audience. And I think Enza was several, several rows up even higher. <laughs> That's right. So, you know, uh, have somebody look out for the Ostrom uh, workshop folks in the, in the audience next time, whatever. Anyway, uh, more seriously, um, one of the things that, that um, uh, I, I still have trouble getting my mind around, getting my hands gripped around to understand. You clearly have a sense in your own mind why more interaction of community members in an opera performance or opera experience, an opera building and, and, and performance experience uh, would be of great use to the community, uh, to the participants and to the members, but you haven't really articulated why other people should believe that same thing. I mean, you're clearly dedicating your, your life and your career to this kind of work. But why should the normal citizen uh, in, um, uh, in, a, in a community or the normal politician who's trying to deliver uh, public goods to those um, um, or private goods to those potential voters and all that, why they should be devoting more money to this kind of experience? Or in your case, it's not as much more money for the experience, but getting ordinary people to, to get involved, um, to take a couple of weeks out of their summer or whatever to participate in this. So what is the, what is the core benefit that you see the participants in these, um, uh, in these camps or these, these laboratories or these uh, 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 situations that you're, 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 you're proposing here that they would benefit from that? Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, thank you so much for very interesting question that allows me to talk about the way that humans are interacting with the arts. And for instance, if we remember in pandemic, and now we are like two years, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the first thing that, they, that the person does when they don't have the possibility to do their normal things is try to refuge the, to put themselves in a, something that, that can, allows a person to, let's say, to think in itself. And one of the things was art. You were reading, you were seeing movies, mm -hmm. you were listening to music, you were painting, you were seeing the nature. That's a very artistic element because as I was pointing at the beginning of the paper, arts have proved to create multiple benefits for the community in so many things from the multi, multi 
uh, intelligence things, you can create all the intelligence or you can develop all the intelligence with the arts. That's proven because there are so many interactions about your brain, how you create art or you do art. Second, there is a huge economic growth uh, because the artistic experience can allow cities, for instance, to create a full business model based on tourism or based on marketing or brand. Those, those kind of things create so much economic movement. But specifically, this kind of camp experience reminds me to think about how you enter or how you appreciate the arts. If there was two years before the production of Parsifal, one Wagnerian opera, that is like four hours and a half long. It's very tough for me that I am conductor, I am training, and for me it's difficult. If you um, invite someone to see this kind of opera for this first time, it's very sure that they will never come back. <laughs> However, if you allow them to experience art, that is the one that we are doing, for instance, in Los Angeles, but seeing all the difficulties that are there, how do you craft a single sound? How do you craft a single poster? How do you craft this kind of artistic experience is letting them to understand what is art and what is opera. And step by step, these people is getting more into the art, not to be professional. There are many people that is not professional, but um, they become more artistic aware. And at, there are two examples of that very important. First of all, the Venezuelan system that is only focused in orchestras. They have little kids playing an orchestra, huge orchestras, like 300 people from every single city in Venezuela. These kind of people understand what is making music, what is teamwork, what is being right about working for one thing. And at the end, they are not professionals, but they understand what is music. And that's why now they understand the value of art and they contribute for that. Therefore, at the end, even there are donors for that. In addition, there is the example of the Nutcracker. Nutcracker is a ballet that is meant to be multi-level. You see little kids doing very simple things. You see students doing a little bit more complex and you see professionals doing very complex things. And that allows that the parents, the families, and so many people is understanding what is the art, is experience, is seeing in the kids that look at how much discipline you have to do to get into these points, therefore is giving you the opportunity. And that also creates the good business model because the parents and the families come for every single show, not for only this one, but also for the others in the, that the kids are not, but now they understand what is important. And that's, that's the clue element of these kind of programs. Excellent. Thanks, that was, that was a very uh, uh, impressive answer. So uh, work that into your next draft somehow. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have it recorded so we can dictate okay. it. There you go. <laughs> It's always tough to recapture, right? Um, thanks a lot, Mike. I think Enzo was next and then, and then Brian after that. And I'm keeping an eye here too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Diego, nice to see you. Um, as long as the camera is moving, but it works quite well, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now I see Scott, yeah. Oh, no, and my loud laugh. I'm um, so sorry. No. I'll shut up. <laughs> um, I, I like very much, it, it's impressive how you right away present this solution to your problem and such an applied work with the camp. Um, I, I was wondering if I get the first part sorted out. So if it should be a paper, first of all, I, I didn't get to the point what your actually research question is. I mean, very basic, what, what do you want to show? Is it, I mean, somehow the sustainability is in the core, but do you want to measure it? according to what criteria so that you later think if we do a camp, it will be better or you somehow, at least that was my impression that you suppose if we do it with these camps, something will be better. So, um, and 
similar to the ERD framework that you are presenting. So what exactly do you want to show with it? I think that also relates to the research question. Also, you nicely present what the solution is. The beginning is not so obvious to me. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. Okay, yeah, that's that's very interesting question because it's what I was thinking too. <laughs> like when I was re writing the paper, even I have thoughts about should I divide this in different papers because like mm -hmm. the opera is one thing and the idea for this, let's say this part of the paper is, look at this is opera. The other in terms of the problems is these, these are the problems and the last part of the solutions, as you say, is having, this is one of the things that I'm not clear to be honest, if there should be one paper or three papers. But also the connection with the camp is something that we discuss a lot with my wife. She is a curator and something that is now called action research, like for me, and I guess it's because I am conductor, for me, to be honest, the paper is not a goal because for me, I'm not saying it's not, not correct, but for me, a paper is going to be placed in, a, in one place and let's see if the people had access or not. For me, our research should be more focused into what we are going to do for the community or for the target group or whatever. And that's why I, I tried to put the full paper into going to the opera camp because a more tangible solution that just works. And yeah, I get your concern too. I have the same. I'm not sure if I just divide the paper and trying to specify every single thing because the research question, yeah, the idea was to define what is that the Santa Fe Opera programs, uh, how they work, and if they are going to be able to be done in different ar arenas. Mm -hmm. I did a little bit of that. I know that we clarify with the AD frameworks, we kind of things can be done and we not. But obviously, there is other parts of the paper that talks about different things. And that's that I totally get that. And I really appreciate your thoughts about, <laughs> about that. Mm -hmm. Th thanks. Okay. Thank you, Enza. And we can, we can do a round of follow ups if we have time as well. And I am keeping an eye on us in the room. <laughs> but I think, Brian, um, then I might jump in with one and if there's a few others. Yeah, please go ahead. That's good. Um, interesting thing to be hearing about. Um, my comments are perhaps be, are beyond the scope of this paper and maybe whether they're things you're uh, might be examining in other papers or already thinking about. Um, so one part is comparing organizations that face similar issues and institutional analysis to you know, look at what's similar and different, including you know, the kind of challenges of trying to keep artistic traditions alive with including you know, how to make the funding work and how do you involve more volunteer or student activities and so on. Um, and that could include orchestras, theater and opera in other cultural traditions. And then the other thing, um, especially in terms of trying to make it sustainable um, or you know, beyond sustainable for growth of, you know, what about people who are not yet, you know, watching, enjoying opera, but might, and to what extent you're considering those or looking at insights on them. And I just took a quick peek at YouTube. And I mean, there's some opera things there with 40 million views. So something's going on out there. Okay, thank you. I guess I very slow. I didn't get your, there was a question. I'm sorry, Brian. Yeah, so maybe you could just restate the first part. Yeah. I'm sorry, okay. I didn't get Are it. you comparing or considering comparing similar organizations like symphony orchestra yeah. or okay. theater? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's the first question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yes and no, let's say. Or 
for this specific research, I didn't do a, a comparison about orchestras or theaters or that. However, obviously, because of my background, I, I've been in charge of orchestras and I've been in charge of musical theater companies. I know a little bit how they, not a little bit, I know how they work. And I can say, it's not in the paper, but I can say that if you analyze orchestra work comparing to opera work, the problem is that, or the advantage for the orchestra is that we have so much many opportunities in terms of the experience. Let's call, as we were talking in the, in the paper, opera experience, let's talk about the concert or the orchestra experience. When you have an orchestra of 200,000 in budget, yearly budget, you usually have six to seven concerts. That means that you have around three or four composers per concert, that is 27, let's say 30. And also you have uh, opportunities about education and all of that. For at the end, you have a broader spectrum of experiences that many people can rely with, can be related with, because you have more room to work. In terms of the operas, if you take our, an opera company of 200,000, you are talking just one shot. <laughs> and that's very complex to do, because how you relate 30 to compare to one. That's why they have less room to move and create experience. That's one of the comparisons that I can do. Uh, and that difficult the opera, because obviously it's very expensive. The, the fact of having so many people. However, that is also a very interesting element that if you are very clever and you understand that there is a huge pool of factors in this unique experience and you craft this opera experience well enough, you are gonna create a very good experience for different people. And that's where I come back to the problem of the subsidized model. Because if a donor says you, I'm gonna put the money for this production, but you are gonna do it in the way that I like, that usually doesn't take into account the community, doesn't take into account the singers, the opera, whatever, you lose this opportunity. And that's why I see we have to create other opportunities that don't create that. That's, that's the idea. Sure, I, have I respond to you? Uh, yeah, and there are a bunch of other questions. So I don't know if you're staying on after, but I'll stop. Yeah, yeah I think so. I will. We can keep the discussion going, I think. Yeah. Yeah, just, just really briefly, because I know we have so many hands going up, but just briefly related to that, Diego, if it's okay. I know one of your slides, you mentioned that only about half the cost of the opera is covered by, you know, for example, just ticket fees here in the here in the U.S. anyway. And just to Brian's point, I was curious, do, do you know how that compares to like the average ballet, you know, company or symphonic orchestra? Like, is that is that more or less par for the course is, or is opera just more more expensive because it includes, you know, both the uh, performance elements, the orchestra elements, maybe the spaces. Yeah, I I have looked. There is a person that should have the response, but it's not now here. That was uh, the director of the Master in Arts Administration was a CEO of, a, of an orchestra. Oh, oh, he should know that, but it's not here. Oh, no problem. But yeah. I have some, let's say, informal information, and the orchestras have better ticket revenues, like around 70, 80%. Oh, really? Okay. I guess she can correct me more in that in that number. And in terms of the ballet, we see, for instance, with Nutcracker, that the Nutcracker, if it's done well, could cover the full year. Is that right? Oh my gosh. It's what, they, it's what they are saying. I'm not totally sure because yeah. I, have to, I haven't looked the numbers, but it's what they are saying. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. We need to get a few more yeah. stars like the Nutcracker under our belts. Yeah, Jess, please. Yeah. So I want to get a two finger on this because it makes me think about a couple of different things. First, given Brian's point about this question and, and your sort of follow up about single fundraiser or like donors wanting to control artistic um, outcomes, this is actually a really similar problem in like nonprofit management and NGOs, right? So there's a lot of literature you could draw on to think about different funding structures that diversify the source such that 
some sort of common shared goal artistically that puts the hand the, the power back in the hands of, of the actual artists, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one idea. The other thing that um, I was thinking about um, was it was sort of this question of um, which is Scott's point about okay, orchestras essentially covering much more with their ticket sales, right? So one question is this, is there a sense that people collectively let's say in the US, know far more numbers of orchestral pieces than they do operatic pieces. So for instance, like I could, I, I spent a long time in classical music, so I could, I could name a whole bunch of like orchestral pieces, but very, very few operatic ones. And, and so one question is, is in this question of building community, is there a question of sort of like figuring out a way of increasing exposure to or community around particular, you know, everybody knows a Nutcracker, everybody knows of La Boheme, right? But like, there's like maybe three or four that I think everybody probably knows of. And so I'm curious if that's part of your model of thinking about, you know, creating a culture around this. It's like creating some more sort of pillar pieces that are like essentially buzz around a subset of pieces that equal maybe the number of um, artistic, uh, of, of sort of pieces or whatever in orchestra or ballet or whatever. That's, that's a great question that allowed me to talk about two things. If we compare with the opera, the opera with the orchestra, as we were doing, the orchestra has so much um, possibilities to allow different experiences. That's why the opera, the orchestra has pop content concerts, for instance, or movie concerts, or uh, community concerts in the schools, of those kind of things. These are the reasons why the orchestra world is getting better financial stability, because you are, at the end, you are connecting more with the community. But at, at the end, these are the people that is going to create the money, either for ticket, or for donations, or for sponsorships. The problem with the opera, as you say, is that there are few, because if you do Falstaff, Falstaff is a very unique show and it's gonna target very unique people. And the problem also, that's what is a governance thing, is that many operas, because of these powerful actors, they are always trying to target or to produce this kind of opera. Therefore, this is the problematic aspect. There are now many operas that are being created uh, around the world that are trying to be more with the current, uh, current topics. Uh, and one of them is what we are trying to do in Los Angeles, for instance. In Los Angeles, we have a plan to create 10 operas about the American culture, mm -hmm. uh, the full continent. Like We are gonna premiere our first community opera summer in Los Angeles. And I call community opera because it's with the multi-level thing that we were talking. It's crafted, was created very specifically to allow those kind of interactions. Because the problem is that despite the fact all the operas have multi-level experience, uh, there is a paper that I wrote uh, about that. If you only do Wagner, uh, Falstaff, all of that, it's gonna be very different, uh, very difficult to put the community to that. That's why, yeah, we are trying to do that. We are trying to create operas uh, that are more connected with our current necessities. And also in the case of the, the camp that I lead in Los Angeles, community and it's kind of multi-level thing. But yeah, that's a huge need that we have. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, we have to change the the sponsor thing and allow that the people that takes the decision doesn't have so much decision for that kind of thing. Awesome. No, thanks a lot. Hey, there's so many rabbit holes we can go down because like even benefit corporations came to my mind as like this new corporate forum that a lot of, you know, for-profit entities, but that want to make a positive social impact are, are pursuing. So anyway, I, I'd, I'd be wondering, I'd be curious to learn more about the experimentation that's happening. Um, but let's do a bit of a lightning round to make sure that we get to folks and we can continue discussing afterward for sure. So uh, Angie, uh, Christine, after that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, Diego. So I was going to, I was going to, I guess I'm accidentally piggybacking off Scott in saying 
you know, I, I think you're quite possibly incorrect. You don't have three papers here. You have 75. And, <laughs> and I will say that, you know, part, I always view part of my role as being the person that reminds you that, you know, you need a couple of research questions. You need to produce something. You need to graduate too, type of thing. Right. And so in my opinion, you need to pick off a couple of things. There's tons of work on how you build community. And if you're making the decisions uh, about, you know, all of this type of stuff, then you're not hearing community voice necessarily. So you, that could be a whole paper. Um, you know, you, you're using again, the term data trust, and we could talk about that specifically, but I don't see anything really written about it, um, which isn't bad, but that's a whole nother area that we could talk about of, you know, data that's, um, you know, intentionally shielded and siloed and how maybe you create a community that uh, and a structure that allows data sharing without revealing competitive advantage uh, in the in the in the data. You know, so, so there's a billion things you could do. And I think you're officially, you know, at that moment where if you were one of my PhD students, I would say, hold on, you're at you're at the moment where you're so excited about everything, which I love that moment, but you're going to have to pick something and walk down that path. And that's going to suck. <laughs> it really is. It always stinks. But you've got to pick that. And then a lot of us, various people can jump in and start helping you. I can talk to you about corporate governance and structures. So there's plenty of people here who could do that. You know, so you're going to have to pick, I, I fear, because the, the paper reads um, like there's a path, but I don't think you found your path yet. And, and, and that's, you know, sorry, that's a, maybe a little longer than a lightning round, but you know, I do think you need to hear that, in my opinion, that you're going to have to pick a path and walk down that path and discard a whole bunch of other stuff and just put footnotes that I see this another day. I see this. This is my book. <laughs> I see this. This is that. Because right now, you know, I don't hear a research. I'm with, I'm with INSA and others. I don't hear a research question that's going to be moved forward, regardless of if you create a camp or a survey or fill in the blank. And you've got to make that choice, in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, no, that's very important because yeah, I I always think so much ahead. Oh, yeah. and I have to pick. That's that's totally true. I mean, for my doctoral degree, as a performer, we usually don't have to present a dissertation thing. We just we have to present two concerts because at the end our work is not research is conduct. Therefore, we do two recitals. And we just do a short final project. That's that's our requirement. That's why for my dissertation, the music, artistic, and pedagogic models that are already written with the people there, that's that's done. Let's say obviously I cannot present now. I I have to end my coursework. I have to, but this is done because I started as soon as I took my first class. I started to work on that. That's why for, for the next thing, it's a, as, I, as I shared, it's a long-term process, but yes, you are right for 22, 23, we have to be clear about the research question. Yes. Just to be sure that every single year we are not trying to do a full thing. Mm -hmm. For now, what I have is administrative community and business models, but yeah, I have to, sit down and, and think if we can do the three ones or it should be one only or yeah, that's totally true. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. That's how these things, that's how these things work. As you know, Diego, I mean, all, this could be a, you know, a re really useful research agenda. Right. Um, and then, you know, based on these discussions, you can decide what's the low hanging fruit I want to pluck now. And we can obviously help you with all the other ones as we move forward here. Really good point, Angie. Um, and then since, you know, we'll, we'll try to keep to a bit of a lightning round, but we'll, we'll keep going after this as well. So yeah, Christina and then, and then Wes and Jamie. So uh, Diego, I have a quick question regarding uh, ticket sales. You mentioned that in Europe, most of the income comes from the government and ticket sales wasn't even on your, on your PPT, I think. So does it mean that tickets are much cheaper in Europe and does it change the, the community of people who go to opera? Do we have any data on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because that allows me to talk about the difficulties accessing that. Mm -hmm. Since I started my dissertation in 2019, 
I started to contact multiple opera companies and programs in the United States, in Europe, and in Latin America. Not in Asia and all of that, because I don't speak these languages. But um, something that was very interesting for me is that United States uh, opera companies were more open to even talk with me. The Latin American companies never respond emails, very similar to Europe. And just two of them in Europe respond me some emails. We tried to program a, a talk to start, even was not about financial things, was just music, artistic and pedagogy. And even with that was very, very difficult. I never got the, the, the meeting. That's some of the things that we have to do if we need to open and be more uh, clear in our research, we have to get this data. What my professor that works in Europe and had a good part with there taught me is that you have to go there and you have to spend time in the opera companies. They have to see you there, that you are like a person that is really working in that. And that way they open a little bit. That's a whole thing. I don't know in tickets. I know that the, the government supports a lot because of my professors were talking me that, but yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Okay, thank you. And I had the one more question about conflict resolution, but I see others have questions too. So maybe later if we still have time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have time. Yeah. Yeah, well I think that's a great idea. Let's just circle back in a couple minutes. I think that sounds wonderful. But Jamie, yeah, do you want to finish this out here? Sure. Diego, I'm sorry, not in person. I missed that memo. Um, and um, I, I was looking at your abstract, though, um, because I still need to delve into your paper. I'm sorry, it's at the Bruce Adolph Masterclass, so I'm running a late, little late on things. But all that to say is you referred to opera as the cultural commons. And I remember we've talked about this. And I want you to reconsider, like, is it a cultural commons or is it this non-market, non, uh, like, is or is it a space that involves elements of the market and elements of other um, economic ecosystems, um, maybe even besides a commons, maybe it's a hybrid system. And I, and I, part of my thinking behind that is that I think, do you think we have many types of goods as well? Um, you know, because there's cost involved and somebody has to pay for that. So do we have say toll goods versus private goods or public goods or common goods? Mm -hmm. All the above. Okay. That's a, that's a question very important because it's the way that we relate with art and that's very important for human. And what's very interesting that like two days ago, my wife sent me a, UNESCO document that was sent, that was done probably one month ago or something. That is the full concept of how art as a cultural common and the use this term has to be thinking and rethink the creativity and the full culture in the world. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I was in the middle of that. I haven't looked at the, the thing, but in general, what we are seeing in the world is that art is being considered a cultural common because we have access to the art in many ways. This is a very important element of, of the culture. Obviously, the problem is the way in that we have access to that because every person can be an artist. But if you create barriers for that, if, you, if your tickets are not well crafted, if you, if you charge for the CD in a way that is not good for the person to access that. Now we are talking about a governance decision that is not allowing the person to enjoy it. Therefore, that's a very interesting discussion about if art should be considered a cultural common. And I guess it's something very important that we could discuss here also in open workshop, trying to analyze all the details, because as the UNESCO proved, it's something that is happening in the world. Probably, I, I haven't looked at I I guess you and me, uh, Jamie, we have to look that because it talks about our things. But yeah, that's a that's a cool thing that we, we need to analyze carefully. Yeah, that's true. Excellent. 
Well, again, we'll let's keep this going, both virtually and, and in the room. But first, let's thank Diego again for such an outstanding job. Really, really fantastic project. So much fun to discuss as well. And, and Jamie, to your point as well, just as a quick reminder, Asif's um, colloquium presentation as well is going to be live and in person. And I believe there will even be cookies on, on Monday at noon. So hope to see you there. <laughs>